So how do you look at this city, Los Angeles, as a Christian? How do you look at this culture out there? Are they uh, friends that we try to emulate? Are they the opponents we try to resist? Are they just fellow journeyers on the way to glory or wherever they are going? Well, we take a look, if you're visiting this morning or watching online, we have been looking at this marvelous book, the Book of Acts. And as we come to the second missionary journey, it has been about four to five years since Paul took his first journey. They have met in Jerusalem, the first church council, and they've decided these Gentiles, these Gentiles who have ham sandwiches and crab dip, you know, who are not kosher, that because the Holy Spirit is falling upon them, they must be accepted. And so they decide to do that before Paul makes this great move. And you know, for you and I, as we interact with this world, and I tell you, um, as I've told you before, when they asked Jesus, is the world going to get better or worse? And he said, yes, it will. <laughs> Evil gets worse as good gets better. And how you and I interact with that has a lot to do with the results in our life, not their life necessarily. I was uh, <laughs> told when I was uh, doing some interims down in Atlanta, uh, a guy told me that a little local town that an evangelist came into town was baptizing people down at the river. And some guy who'd been at a party all Saturday night stumbled on down and he got in line. He thought it was brunch. And he came walking up and the evangelist grabbed him and put him underwater and brought him up and said, have you found Jesus? And he said, no. And he put him underwater and brought him up again and said, did you find Jesus? He said, no. He put him down and held him down longer and brought him up and said, did you find Jesus? And he said, no. Are you sure this is where he fell in? But you know the world looks at it that way in a lot of ways. So we take a look at this second missionary journey. We'll find out Paul does something he does all the time. He goes back and he goes forward. He goes back to where he's been and reestablishes and grows, but he goes to places he's never been before. Remember, Christ goes up, the Spirit comes down, and the church goes out. The Holy Spirit leads these people in places they weren't planning on going. In fact, we have this map here uh, of his second missionary journey. Those are all of his journeys. But if you uh, take a look at the purple, he's leaving. Remember, Antioch is the home church. There, by the way, is Tarsus. He goes back to his home. He's on the way up. He's going through present-day Turkey. He makes his way over to Troas. By the way, it's about 800 miles right there. Then they see the vision and he takes the gospel over to Europe. The boy from Macedonia calls him. Philippi, Philia, Thessalonica, Thessalonica we call it, Berea, makes his journey on down uh, by boat, ends up in Athens. And from Athens, he goes to Corinth. From Corinth, he sails back to, remember, Ephesus. This will be a home base for him. And then on down to Jerusalem, and from Eusherelium, he will go back to the home church at Antioch. That's about three and a half years and about 1,700 miles. And as he goes along in this way, we find out God brings these incredible truths to you and I. And one of them is building on the past, going back. Notice the passage that we read already. John Mark, remember, bails on him on the first journey? And Barnabas, Barnabas, the great encourager, who's the only one that will take a risk on Paul, by the way, Saul of Tarsus. And so John Mark bails out, and Barnabas goes, so he's a kid. And Paul goes, we got way too much at stake for this. He can grow up somewhere else. So they will part ways, and as far as we know, we don't have much communication between them for several decades. And yet, at the end of Paul's life, 44 years later, when he's on death row, he says, of the few people that will be around Paul, and Paul is a lightning rod, bring John Mark. Because John Mark and Barnabas will have reconnected that way. Isn't it true in your life? Do you have friends that used to be friends, but now they're frenemies? They won't talk to you anymore? And isn't, don't you always kind of process through how that, ever, a lot of times it's the pain of family members. A lot of times it's close friends that we once had and now we don't. Don't close the door. 
Don't walk into relationships that are toxic and self-destructive. There's nothing God glorifying about that. But always leave it open. And on this time where Paul and Silas go off, he will find out when he goes back to Lister there, the two of his greatest friends for the rest of his life, a young man by the name of Timothy, and all of a sudden we find the wee passages three times of Luke. Luke along the way when he's at Troas. So if we take a look at this uh, next passage here in Acts uh, 16, as this movement continues on, of, uh, as they're heading their way, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. This is really weird, watch this. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, when they came opposite Mycenae, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. And then a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia standing beseeching him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately, what? We. And went from the third person to the first. They, he, 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 we. This is Luke. We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So for some reason, they try, they want to go, and Paul always goes to the big cities where there's influence. He'll still go to the Jews. He'll go to the synagogue and use that, tell about Jesus being the Messiah and the spirit of Jesus. Notice the interchange, the Holy Spirit and the spirit of Jesus are the same. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit saying no, no. And Paul, the little pit bull that he is, is going to keep trying. And the Holy Spirit keeps saying no. You know, the need is not always the call. You may see some great needs, and God might say, yeah, not yours. And we say, what do you mean? Nope, got you for something else. And we're saying, what are you talking about? And he's, that's why the worst thing to do is to try to be somebody else. As one of the philosophers said, be yourself, everybody else is taken. Just be who you are and let the Holy Spirit decide and guide the, the direction that we go in this. And so he keeps pushing on and now he's going back to the past and now he'll go on to uncharted territories. Paul is brilliant, if not boring on genius. Paul is taught by Gamaliel, the greatest mind of first century Judaism. Paul was taught that it'd be like having your boys and girl taught math by Einstein. He is hand-groomed for a number one spot in the corporation. He was made to be a debater. And we only have a handful of times in his 40 years of apostleship he ever does that. And this is one of them. When he gets to Athens, he is what he was made for this stuff. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic, pause here a sec, Epicurean, remember the view that life is, you live and you die, so you might as well enjoy pleasure. They're not just partiers. They're trying to get the best out of that. Stoic, these are kind of, if you will, the ascetics, it's by reason and logic. And whatever doesn't kill you makes you better. That is a stoic statement. And so both of them are there, met him. And some said, what would this babbler say? <laughs> Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus in the resurrection. So they took hold of him and brought him to Areopagus. It's the head, the top there saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you present? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. Does this sound like us in our Fox News or MSNBC? So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. 
I found also an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. But therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he, he sees, now you see what he's doing. Paul, and this is something for you and me to learn. He will change his method anytime he needs to. He will never change his message. It's not his to change. And you and I have styles and ways of doing things, and at times we need to say, doesn't work. Try something else. But we don't alter the message. And the message is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes would have everlasting life and not perish. That God has revealed himself. But one of the things that we have to learn as we're interacting, and particularly we who are a more conservative nature theologically than a lot of our brothers and sisters. Now this is just solo brewer, so treat it as gospel. But anyway, <laughs> the five P's in present day theology. <clears throat> the person and work of Christ, personal relationships, and here's where we conservatives, we have conferences and stuff of how to bring, how to have better relationships, how to get along with people in your office, person work right. But then the next three, poverty, peacemaking, and pollution. That's where a lot of our denomination is. Poverty, caring for the poor, of course we should be caring for the poor. Peacemaking, how do we make peace in this fractured world and what about being stewards of the earth? Those that have a small person work of Christ might have big three on the others. Use that. Use to say, this is where we understand, <clears throat> not because it's a hip thing to do, but because God wants us to be stewards. And we find out as God goes along the way that sometimes learning from others, and particularly learning from the children, our younger. Or those of us that are, have, still have kids or grandkids, listen to them and what they're talking about. By the way, remember they tell you, always be kind to your children because they'll pick out your nursing home. You heard that before? <laughs> always care for them. And listen, what are they? And by the way, and those right here with the writer strike and thing, if you listen to what's going on in this city, making the culture, they're asking theological questions, though they don't know it. What is life about? What are we doing? What is a peace? What is a, what is a comfort that I can have in this world? And learning how to interact with that. And as Paul says, you are so close and yet you are so far away. At every step, God uses all things. Paul, who was made, and this is the only time we have, what does he do? So does he lecture in the university? No. He does what Papa did. He's a tent maker. Why? to raise money so the mission can keep going on. This brilliant mind sitting here making tents and curtains and whatever it takes for people to sell. God asks us to come alongside whatever he opens up for us in this sense to be able to step out and to realize that what we say is not about us, it's about Christ. And the impact that this will have upon us. Three centuries later, Rome is not Christianized yet. Constantine has not yet said, saw the Cairo, the two, first two letters of the Greek alphabet, the XP, you'll see very often, and by this, be safe, fight under this banner. And Constantine, by the way, doesn't make the empire Christian. Theodosius will do that 100 years after Constantine. But when the emperor finds Jesus, a lot of people find Jesus. But before that, there were Christians fighting for the Romans. Remember John the Baptist? He didn't tell him quit fighting for Rome. He said, if you're a soldier, only take what you're paid. Be ethical in your being of the military. Sebastian up north, there was a campaign taking place. And at this time, one of the emperors, and it depend on which emperor was throned at that time, whether they had terrible purging of Christians or not. And this one particular emperor was... So-so about Christians, it's about 290. And they were gathered together and he decided if any of them were Christian and they were part of their troops, the Roman army, that they were to come and make a pinch of incense to Caesar. Caesar Curios, once a year is an allegiance to Caesar. 
And the Christians wouldn't do it. They would say, Christos Kyrios, Jesus is Lord. And they're going, I don't care what you believe. Just knock that off and say, Caesar's Lord. And they wouldn't do it. So 37 of them were, this was up north of Italy in the Alps. And it was beginning of winter. And they ordered them to strip down naked and to walk onto a frozen lake and to stand out there. And when they were ready to come back, they could come back and get their clothes as long as they were willing to give honor to Caesar. And they went out as all their troops and only 37 of them were out on that lake. And they were singing and they were freezing to death and they were huddled together and one of them finally thought, what will my death do? And he crawled on his knees across that frozen lake to the side and a Roman guard seeing him, watching him, took off his cloak and put it over him and took off all of his clothes and marched out to the lake to take his place to die. He was so moved by watching these Christians. One of the things that Romans couldn't stand, and the Christians were always a warm act. act. The real act, remember, were the gladiators. But they would execute them as criminals. Is what they couldn't stand is the incessant singing of these Christians as they went to their death. They sang together. They knew in a matter of moments they'd be with the Lord. Even as they and their families were being terribly killed. And martyrios, remember, just means witness. As they said, the blood of the martyrs were the seeds of the church. I don't know that any of us in this place will ever have to die for Christ. By the way, if the time comes, you on your own would never have that strength. The Holy Spirit would come upon you. But you and I, when we come to this table, we come and we say, well, we're willing to do what Francis called the crucium sacramentum the great exchange, that this table means we take the commerce of God's wealth and we take who we are and we exchange it. And God says, you give me all of you. You don't hold back your fears, your failures, your sins, your successes, your dreams, your hopes. You take all of that and you give it to me and I'll give you all of me. And that's what this table is about. Some have called this, this morning they will call this Eucharisto, Greek for meaning giving thanks for what God has done, the Eucharist. Others will call it Holy Communion, meaning our oneness with each other and with the Lord. Many of us will call it the Lord's Supper, the last thing that Jesus did with his disciples in that Passover meal before his passion and crucifixion. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is a table of any of you who look to Christ for salvation and those that are willing to follow him, to come and to joyfully partake. As we come, we'll be doing this by intention. If you come down to these center aisles and our servers will be here, and as they dip the, you dip the bread or as you hold the bread and take the cup, when you crush that bread in your teeth, you and I will never be crushed for our sins, though we deserve it, because Christ took the hit for us. And through the miracle of biology, how that little bit of grape juice becomes a part of your body, so spiritually we ask the Lord to come into the nooks and crannies of all of our life and to take over. Either way, this is the great feast. Shall we pray? God Almighty, we thank you that we all are on our own missionary journey, Lord. It's called our life. And Lord, as we interact with people, we thank you for the Apostle Paul and for Barnabas and for Timothy and Luke and those who just simply loved and told the truth. And God, I pray for us. I thank you, Lord, as you build upon the past of 120 years of this great church here, Lord, that you build upon it, Lord, and take us to new things, Lord, in the new next chapters. But Father, we come now and ask that you'd set aside this these elements from a common to a holy use and seal your people to your heart. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sin of our lives, grant us your shalom, your peace. In your name we pray.